Lord, I praise you for who you are. Thank you for the promises that you make, that all of them hold true. Thank you for your best, Father. I thank you, Father, for hope. Thank you for your daily portion of grace and love. Thank you, Lord, for your guidance. I thank you, Father, that you are faithful, and I thank you that you are good. Lord, I would like to lift up my life before you, that you might continue working in my life every day, because I need you, Lord. I pray for the church that we would rise up in this time. You've told us not to keep our eyes on things of the world, but to keep our eyes fixed on you. Lord, prosper your word. Lord, that everyone will know you are God. Help me to put you first in every decision we make, Father. I pray for courageous leadership and boldness to do what is right in your eyes. You're the Messiah, you're the one to guide us. Lord, I pray today that you will provide a job for me. Your word says that if your people who are called by your name will humble ourselves and pray, you will heal our lands. In Jesus' name. 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 Good morning. In Jesus' name. Good morning. Uh, as it said, my name is Pete Stansberry, and I get to kind of head off this next series, this three-week series on pray, on prayer. And a um, little housekeeping, take care right off the bat here. On our outlines, the blanks are all scripture addresses. So the outline this week is just all Bible, except for the, the title there. <laughs> Everything else is out of the Bible. So, for example, the first blank is going to be Psalm 19. The second blank is going to be Acts 2, 16. And the rest of them will show up as we go through it. What I want to do is I want to quote for you Psalm 19, or try to anyways. Um, it's a special psalm too. I call it my morning psalm, and um, I'll touch on it a little bit more when I'm done. Hopefully I get through this. The heavens declare your glory, O Lord. The firmament sows forth your handiwork. Day and the day it utters speech. Night unto night it reveals knowledge. There is no language, no speech where your voice is not heard. Your lines have gone out through, through all the world, your word to the end of the world. And in them you've established a tabernacle for your son. He's like a bridegroom coming forth from his chamber, rejoicing like a strong man to run the race set before him. It's rising us from one end of heaven, and its circuit is to the other, and nothing is hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimonies of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are righteous, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord are pure, enlightening the eyes. And the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. And the judgments of the Lord, they are righteous and true altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yes, much fine gold, and sweeter than honey and the honeycomb. And moreover, by them your servant is warned. And in keeping them, there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me, Lord. Cleanse me, Lord, from secret faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Don't let them have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgressions. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your eyes, O Lord, my strength, my redeemer. I love that psalm. Let me pray for a, a second here. This is about prayer. Lord, I love your word. I love the psalms. I love you. Everything in your word, God. And Father, I pray tonight that your word, or this morning, that your word would speak. That you would speak. Holy Spirit, come. Come and do what only you can do. Touch lives. Open your word up to us. Unpack this for us, Lord. For your glory, for your name's sake. I ask this, Jesus, in your name. Amen. I love the Psalms. I've memorized several of them. The 19th Psalm I call my morning psalm. I quote it, that psalm when I walk into work. And one of the things I love about it is it's, it starts out, the creation declares the glory of the Lord. The firmament shows forth, the creation it shows forth his handiwork. And we, you, me, we are his creation. We get to declare his glory. It's not just the, the sunsets and the sunrises and the stars and the wonders and the ocean and all the wildlife and all the beauties of his creation, but we are a part of it. And we get to declare his glory. We show forth his handiwork. We're made in his image. It's incredible. Incredible psalm. And it kind of goes through about the creation. And he talks about 
the sun rising from one end of heaven and circuitous to the other, and nothing is hidden from its heat. And the next line is about the word of the Lord. And he talks about how the word, hmm, kind of spent here, sorry about that. I'm glad the front row is empty. <laughs> talks about the word, how the word is kind of like the sun, the heat that, that, that permeates, gives life to everything. And he compares that with the word of God. And that it ends with a prayer, Lord, you know, how, how can I understand my errors? Cleanse me, Lord, of secret faults. Keep back your servant. Keep me back from presumptuous. That means like intentional. I know it's wrong, but I think I can get away with it. Keep me back from those presumptuous sins. You know? So I'll be blameless and innocent of great transgressions. And this, these last three verses are worth memorizing. It says, that, let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, be acceptable in your eyes, Lord. Isn't that precious? But there, there, if you tie that in with another passage, you know... In Acts, at Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, verse 16, Pentecost happens. The Spirit is being poured out on the church. They're gathering and they're praying, and they're all they're seeking God, and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit is poured out on them. And they're all, like, communicating with each other. Now, in Jerusalem at Passover, they're coming from all over, all over the whole area, so everybody speaks different languages or different ethnics, different backgrounds. But all of a sudden, there's like this unity, and there's communication, and everybody can understand each other, and there's like fellowship. It's like first communion. It's like the first body of Christ. And, you know, people are watching this and going, what is going on there? They must be all drunk at just a big party or something. And, and Peter gets up, and he, he kind of speaks the first message in the church. And he goes, no, this is that. Because this, what you see here, is that which was prophesied by Joel, where Joel said, I'll pour out my spirit on the church, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. I love that phrase, this is that. And when we're talking about prayer, and that's where I'm going to start to kind of, I'm going to talk a little bit about the creation and some things in God's creation and tie it into prayer. And kind of like a this is that thing. Because when we pray, what's drawn us here today is God. And most of us might not even know that, but the Holy Spirit is moving in our lives, and he draws us here. And when we start to recognize the word, we start to recognize this is that that I'm hungry for. And we start to recognize in the word that this is what's going on right now, that I need to apply this to that. And we start to make those connections, and God starts to move, and heaven starts to come, and his will starts to be done, and things start to change. And that's what prayer is all about. Prayer, this is that. Your kingdom come, your will be done. This is that. What I'm going to talk about today is a, a twist on, on prayer. Because if we look at nature, we can learn things about God. And it all declares God. We get to declare God. Our lives should declare God. What I want to look at today is a lion. I love lions. They're awesome, amazing, incredible creatures. And I want to look at a scripture. It comes out of Revelation chapter 5, verses 4 through 6. It says, so I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I looked and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb. Now that's kind of, kind of weird because the elder says, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah and this guy, this kind of prophetic, John, he's kind of caught up in heaven. He goes, and I looked and behold, a lamb. One is seeing a lamb, and another is seeing a lion. Kind of peculiar, isn't that? Well, Jesus came 2,000 years ago as a lamb. He was a sacrificial lamb. We know that he fulfilled all the kind of the prophetic picture of Passover. He is our Passover lamb. He was the lamb given up for our sins. He was a lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. 2,000 years ago, he came as a lamb. I honestly believe the next time he shows up, it's going to look like a lion. Amen. It's not going to be a lamb. He is going to be a lion. And I think in, in, in the body of Christ, we have this lamb mentality about prayer. And I think God and the Holy Spirit is kind of prompting us to have a lion mentality, to grow up. 
We must become ferocious in our prayers. Let me read another passage to you, and I'm, I'm going to kind of unpack this a little bit and hopefully put this together. Before I get into that, Genesis 48, 8 and 9, Judah, Lion of the tribe of Judah. In the Hebrew, every pronoun has a meaning. You know, some people say a lot of the Old Testament hasn't been translated yet because we have all these names out there. We really don't know the significance of the names. When you see the name Judah, it should trigger the name praise. Because basically, this is what he's saying is, lion of the tribe of praise. This is a praising lion. And when you think about, it, to me, lions, when I look at uh, the majesticness of a lion, it's kind of praise rises up within me. I thought, man, that thing is awesome. That thing is powerful. Lions are incredible animals. But the lion warrants praise. So let's, having said that, because he is the lion of the tribe of Judah, let's move on. John 53, 56. Then Jesus said to them, most assuredly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise him up to the, at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood, abides in me, and I in him. And if you read a little further in John chapter 6, some of the disciples go, this is a hard saying. Who could understand this? And they left. But Jesus is saying, eat my flesh. Eat of my body. I think when a lion sees a lamb, he doesn't see a cute little lamb, what we see. Some of the cuddly little thing. We have all this compassion in us, and we think, oh, it's a sweet little lamb. I think that lion, he doesn't even see meat. I think what the lion sees is life. I think he sees life. And I think, although the lion doesn't really think or process or anything like that, he knows that if he doesn't get that life, he will lose his life. That life is essential for his continuing, for his life. And there might be kind of a twist in that that's applicable to our prayer. Because when Jesus says, ask, seek, and knock, you know, that seeking, I don't think it's just a flippant, like, bless us, O Lord, for these, I guess, we're about to receive from the body of Christ, the Lord, amen, and digging in. I think the seeking is a little bit more like, God, I am so grateful for what you've done for me. It's heartfelt, like the lion on the prowl that is after it. He's on the hunt. There's, there's some, you know, intensity. There's some determination. There's some intentional, deliberate work going on. And I think with prayer, that might be kind of the picture. I think with Jesus, that is the picture. I think when Jesus looks at us, he looks at us like a lion hungry for us. He's got this ferocious love. He doesn't want to consume us to destroy us. He wants to consume us. Because like when a lion eats a lamb, that lamb becomes part of its body. And when he consumes us, we become part of his body. And Jesus wants us to be part of his body. He says, eat of my body. Because we can have communion with him. That's really what we do in communion. We eat the flesh. The bread represents the flesh. You know? We have that communion when we eat of the body. It's kind of a weird picture, but I think Jesus is after us with this intense love. And he has this line that rises up within us and wants us after him with that intense love. And not only after him, after each other. Because he said, eat on my body, which is we are his body. Basically, eat of each other. He said it's kind of a hard saying. It's a different thought. But maybe when we start to think in Jesus' name, we might be thinking, what you're hungry for, Jesus, what your appetite is for, what you are seeking instead of what we're seeking, maybe having his appetite. You know, in our midst, we have lions. In this church, we have lions. I know this because I'm one of them. Now, sometimes I'm meek and like a sheep, like a little lamb. But sometimes I come in here and I have a hunting heart. I am like seeking meat. I am like seeking life, as strange as that may sound. And I read something this past week, 
that kind of clued me in that this is not unusual for me. And I see it happen in other people here, and I'll explain that in a second. But it's been going on for hundreds of years, maybe thousands of years in the church. There is a guy by the name of Charles G. Finney. He's known as, some in his book, it says he is America's greatest evangelist. He lived, like, from, born in the 1790s, died around 1870s. Created just churches everywhere. They estimate he led more than 500,000 people to the Lord through his ministry. Just somebody that was hungry and after God. Kind of has eyes like the lion on the one before. In the midst of his book, I was reading his autobiography. In the midst of his book, I read this. I instructed my church members to scatter themselves over the whole house and to keep their eyes open in regard to any that were seriously affected under preaching and, if possible, to detain them after preaching for conversation and prayer. When I say we have lions in here, what we have in here is people. Well, let me give you an example. Friday night, I came down to our church because I love our church. And there's usually things happening here. Friday night, there was about 200 kids in this place. They had a lock-in, an Halloween, annual Halloween lock-in. And I went upstairs, and Jacob Gaines, Pastor Jacob, was preaching up a storm up there. I love Pastor Jacob. <laughs> we are so gifted. Be praying for this young man. He is a man of God. He's an awesome blessing to us. So he's up there preaching up a storm. And I, I, I walk in there and I see like 200 kids just packed upstairs. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to practice what I'm preaching here. I'm going to be a lion and I'm going to prowl <laughs> on this. I'm going to, on, on this flock that are here, you know. I'm, it doesn't think predator kind of rose up within me. So I started watching. And I started looking, and I started listening, and I started looking across the flock and watching. And I could see, and this is happening in here right now. There are people doing this right now. I could see where God was moving on people. I could kind of see conviction. I could see where people were being affected by the word of God. I could see where people might start to weep, or people were just kind of quiet, or they're just serious. And somehow, intuitively, I knew God is touching this life. This person is serious. They are hunting for God. They are here for a purpose. They're not here just because it's a lock-in. There's something in this kid that goes a little bit further than that. He knows he's in the house of God. He knows he's in the house of prayer. And he's seeing, he's looking to see if there's anything serious, anything real, anything that can last happening in this place. And I, by the grace of God, I can see that. And I pick people out. I picked out like six lambs. Friday night, and sat down with him. Hey, hi, I'm Pete. What's your name? Where do you go to school? You ever been here? You know, what's your story? Would you mind if I pray with you? I just, you know, I, I tell him what I do. I go, I, I, I come into this place, and I look to see if God's affecting anybody, and I just want to pray that you get closer to God. I just want to bless that. I want to invite you. I want you to come back. I want you to know you got people here that love you and care for you and will pray for you, and I just start got a, a nice conversation to talk with, and then pray with them. Like a wolf, like a, like a lion. <laughs> I pray on them. We have people in here. I, I, when I spoke this last night, somebody told me after the message, goes, you know, Kathy Miller is like that. <laughs> I watched her during the conference. She's like a shark. <laughs> she, she just goes, goes after people, you know. There are people here watching to see who's getting impacted by the word of God. You know, the, Jesus told us, watch and pray. Watch and pray. You watch, see what happens, pray. When I pray with one of these young men, or one of these, and they start getting serious and come to God, and then they do something like maybe join the internship, or they get more involved, and then years later I see them up here leading worship, or, or sharing communion, or, or serving in the house of God with a passion and a fire for God. Do you know how Incredibly satisfying that is to me. I don't think I can begin to put words on it. There is nothing greater than just knowing that God has used you in some little way to impact somebody's life. It is, to me, that is the meat of being in God's body. You know, when that land gets ate by Jesus, it decreases and disappears. And the lion increases. Kind of like John was saying, 
That's one of the next verses on there is John 3.30. He must increase, but I must decrease. Being ate up by the lion, the lamb of God, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Scripture tells us in Hebrews 5, 12 through 14, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness. For he is a babe. But solid meat belongs to those who are of full age. That is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to both discern good and evil. When you start to get used by God, there's nothing else that compares with it. But by reason of use, you start to discern meat. <laughs> you start to discern the body of Christ. You start to get an, a spiritual appetite. And you start to see what Jesus is hungry for. And you start to look and really watch and pray. To really start to seek after what God is seeking after. To start to hunger for what God is hungering for. And I, I, the purpose of prayer is to raise us up to this type of relationship with God. Because we are his body. We get to eat of his body. We get to live and thrive for him. We get to pray on his body. Now, this word position to pray is a title of this message. Because I'm a lamb of God. I'm a child of God. When Jesus came, he, and he, he said they were scattered. He says a flock was scattered. And I was moved compa with compassion because it was like they were like sheep without a shepherd. They were just, they didn't have a leader. And they were just scattered all over the place. You know? And Jesus, you know, he wants to draw us close to him. Because if like sheep we get scattered out there, there's another lion. There is another lion. Let me read to you this next passage. If you guys, I hope, are plugging into scripture verses here. This is 1 Peter 5, 5 through 8. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. You know, you might want to put on the side Philippians 2, chapters 1 through 12, or verses 1 through 12. It's a good reference to tie in with this if you ever do any studying. It says, be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. See, Satan is really an imposter. He is not the lion, but he tries to act like a lion. And he is going around seeing who he can devour. He is looking for that lamb that has kind of broken off from the flock that is out there on its own. He is looking for what he can eat. Because Satan wants to eat too. God wants to eat us and consume us with his love, to consume us into his body. Satan wants to eat us to destroy us. And when I say position to pray, I want us to kind of get a hold of it and recognize that we are all prey. Not P-R-A-Y, P-R-E-Y. That if we're not aware and sharp and discerning, we're going to get eight. We are going to get eight. The choice is, by who? Do we want to be ate or eaten? I'm not sure how the proper grammar is. Do we want to be eaten by God, by Jesus, and become a part of his body? Or do we want to be destroyed by an imposter who has a roar that is a lot worse than his bite, but he will destroy us if we don't discern him and recognize him moving in our lives? I believe Satan has... Like a lot of lions out there. Now, it's interesting. It kind of ties in. You can a little play of words here. A bunch of lions is called a pride. You know? And I think what Satan has is this pride of lions that are trying to devour us. Another way to look at this is sin. It's just the desire to have our own way. It's pride that rises up within us. This desire that, you know, the presumptuous sin. I can get away with this. It's not that big deal. You know? Well, that lion, that lie, that sin is trying to devour us. And the reason the lion wants to eat us and the reason God doesn't want us going into sin, it's a question of righteousness, yes. But, you know, 
when he asked Jesus, what's the greatest sin, you know, or what's the greatest commandment? He goes, love the Lord God with all your heart and love your brother like yourself. And sin stops both of those or either of those from happening. That's really what sin does. The, the stealing, the lying, the adultery, the coveting, the having other gods, worshiping other idols, all of that is about breaking relationship. Breaking our relationship with God or breaking our relationship with each other. And that's what Satan wants to do. And the core, and Andy touched on this a couple weeks ago. Pastor Andy's talked about pride at the root of it. The core at the root of it all is pride. Oh, I can deserve to have my own way. You know, I, this is my life. I deserve to be able to do what I want to with it. We have this self-righteous pride that rises up within us. And we don't recognize that we're deceived. We don't recognize that Satan is out to destroy. Maybe we might get our own way, but it'll destroy a relationship. Maybe we might get our own way, but all of a sudden we will be distant and disconnected and hurting. There's, the enemy is out to devour you. The title of the message, when I get, once again, position to pray. I want you to recognize, I want us to recognize, I want to recognize that I am a lamb. And I need to choose whose lamb I am. I want to choose what I am feeding, who I am feeding. Whether I want to feed God to his glory, the glory of his body, or Satan to the deception and my destruction and the destruction of my friendships and relationships. I need to kind of choose between the two. And, and Jesus, with his ferocious, overwhelming all-consuming, never-ending, incredible love that he is after us with has made it so easy. He has made it so easy for us, but we just, out of pride, reject this gift that was given, this free gift that is given to us because we want to have our own way. We want to do our own things. We want to feed the lion that we're not even aware that we're feeding, and it's destroying us and our families and our friendships because we are not, we're prideful. We're prideful. And Jesus out of his love says, hey, I took care of it. All you got to do is turn to me. Just repent. Just turn. Just turn back to me. Let me consume you. Give me your life. I want to eat you up. I want your finances. I want your marriage. I want your body. I want, I want your home. I want your family. I want your job. I want everything. Let me consume you. Become part of my body. And see if you don't have life beyond anything you can comprehend. But you have to turn. You have to leave. You have to give up your pride. The pride of Satan. The pride of lying lions. And go after God. It is so easy what Jesus said. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You have to come to Jesus. We preach it, teach it, say it every week. Come to Jesus. To position yourself to pray, whether it's as a lamb of God or to pray effectively for God, first and foremost, you have to come to Jesus and give him your life. And not just some flippant lip service, but uh, Jesus, I give you all. I am yours. Use me for your glory, for your name, for your body. Use me for your sake. And we give him our all. And we become his. And we start to pray in Jesus' name. What you are hungry for, I will I'll hunger for. What you seek, I will seek. What you want, I want. I am yours. I'm your lamb. I'm your child. I belong to you. Give me your heart. I will hunger for what you hunger for. <clears throat> to position ourselves to pray, we have to be in Jesus. He's our Savior. He is the only way. And then there's a second aspect that we have to be aware of. Because there are things that will separate us from God. And this happens to many Christ followers. It's something I'm continuously fighting and being aware of. The next few scriptures here are Psalm 66, 18 and 19. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. Well, think about it. If Satan is hungering and trying to eat something through me out of 
twisting me with pride and giving me hunger and desires for my own way, to do my own thing. God's not going to hear that. He's not going to honor that. That's not his appetite. That's not what he's after. It needs to be turned from. That's not, it's something that's going to destroy. God's saying, if I, but he says, as soon as we turn from it. And he, Isaiah said in 59, 1, 2, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy, that it cannot hear. But your iniquities, what you're hungering for, have separated you from your God. All of us have sin operating in our hearts. We have this lion within us trying to devour and destroy. And the, the, the purpose of of this message, the purpose of these words I'm speaking is to make us more aware of that so that we pray. We're in a series. We're getting in a series called Pray. And it's so simple because it's all like, Jesus, I'm sorry. Help me. Prayer is not complicated. Jesus, <laughs> out of his love, did not make it tough and a lot of hoops we got to jump through. He made it so incredibly simple, it baffles us. It's just, okay, Jesus, I accept you. I want you. How difficult is that? There's sacrifices involved. Paul put it in Romans 8. He says, all the day long we're counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we're more than conquerors through him who loves us. For I am fully persuaded that neither life nor death nor anything shall separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus beautiful verse but there are you know we got to lay down these things that are separating us that's why the prayer teams are up here that's why we end every service with prayer because we need God the leadership in our church know it we I mean the leaders we need God and we know you need God we all need God and we invite you to come come give up your pride go forward Come with us. Go after God. Eat of him because he is good. He is so good. He has peace for us. It goes beyond all understanding. He has a joy that will become our strength. He has a love that is overwhelming. It's incredible. It is so good. The, the eat of Christ, the things that I get to experience in this house, the poor little sheep that I eat, <laughs> the meals I have, <laughs> are so good and their lives are blessed their lives are so good because Jesus it's so simple pray recognize your prey and pray recognize your prey and pray and it it's so very simple Jesus said first John chapter 1 verse 9 if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's come to Jesus. I'm so sorry. I missed you. I'm so sorry I missed you. Get me back on target. I want you, and I want what you want. Simple prayer. Simple prayer. Let me, I want everybody to bow their heads, close their eyes. I'm going to read something, and then we're going to kind of wrap up here. God looks at the heart, not our outer appearance. Does what we hunger for and seek truly declare the glory of the Lord, or does it selfishly reflect Satan, who, like a roaring lion, goes around devouring all he can? Are we truly praying in his name? Are we truly hungry for what he is hungry for? Does he truly have our hearts, our lives, our possessions, our will, our all? Have I been or am I now positioned to and for prayer? Do I know the thrill of eating with him, for him, in his name? Lord, Help us to hunger for what you hunger for, to seek what you desire. Perhaps you have never realized how much he hungers for you. 
why he went to such lengths to make a way for you, to make a place for you, a place where you fit, a part of his body. If you have never accepted the gift he has for you, pray this simple prayer. Jesus, I want you. I now see how much you desire and hunger for my presence. I accept what you did on the cross for me. Humbly, I acknowledge you are the way, the only way. I gratefully and humbly accept the place you have for me in your body. And thank you, Lord. Or perhaps you've drifted away, hungered for other things. If these words have brought to light that maybe what you have been desiring, seeking, and hungering for is not what he is desiring and seeking. Maybe you've just been a little presumptuous. He is faithful and just to forgive us. All we have to do is turn from our pride and ask. Will you ask? Will you return to his table? Will you recognize today what the creator of the universe desires and hungers for? It's you. Will you return to what is truly food, what will truly satisfy there is nothing else that will ever compare to his goodness and what he has in store for you. I would encourage you to come up 